Good morning. <laughs> uh, welcome back to the fourth day of CryoM course. So today we are with Henry, who's going to tell us how to draw this difficult data set. Um, so good morning, everyone. Um, thank you all for being here nice and early today. Um, so yesterday you already heard uh, from Shaw's, you know, the under, about the underlying theories of data processing. And what I'm going to try to do today is to kind of uh, showing you how, as users, we can effectively use these wonderful programs that people has provided to tackle some of the challenge, more challenging complexes. So you have heard in the last few days a lot about single particle CARIM, but I'm going to just kind of go through the pipeline again, just show you where we are for the talk today. Um, so first, you heard from Katerina's talk of sample preparations and what can go wrong at this stage. And then you put your sample onto these uh, cryon grids, as you can see here on the right-hand side. And then your 3D molecules are in these random orientations. And then you put it in this fancy white box that's, you know, you don't know what's going on out there. But if you watch Chris's lecture, you can see what's going on inside this, this box. And you shine electron beam on it, and you collect uh, what we call electron micrographs. And on these microcrafts, you have these 2D projections of these 3D molecules. And what you have to do is to reconstruct these 3D structure from these noisy projections. So, you know, the last over a decade or so, Shaw's, lab, uh, Shaw's and his lab has developed this wonderful program called Rely On, which we can all rely on, as you can see. And it's, it's uh, basically uh, you can see more details on his lectures. And this is one of the most popularly used uh, software currently. I'm going to spend most of my talk uh, pointing out some of these useful features rely on you can use. And where is appropriate, I'm also going to talk a little bit about some other packages that are also available which you can use. And in a nutshell, for a very perfect case, for example, apoferritin, and this is a typical uh, workflow you can see on the left-hand side of rely on data processing uh, pipeline. And put it this in kind of a short pipeline, what you do first is you collect your own movies and then do motion correction. And then you estimate the CTF. And then you pick your particles on these micrographs. And then you do 2D classification and get these class averages on the right-hand side. And then you do 3D classification pick your favorite one, you refine, and then what you already heard from Shaw's talk, you can do a lot of these polishing operations, CTF refinement and so on, and then that allow you to get your nice structure. And if you are Takanorian process this very, very well, you can even push the resolution limits to currently 1.2 angstrom. You can see here, this is the current state of the art where we can achieve. But that's not, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to be here to tell you all of these more well-behaved cases uh, because I'm going to here to tell you a little bit when things are atypical. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to highlight three examples all coming from the LMB in the last couple of years or so. And, um, and then later on, late in the talk, at the end, I'm going to show you in more details how people use uh, some of the software to, uh, to process more challenging data. So some papers, if you go to the supplementary information, you can see how they get the structure and you see this table, it's kind of daunting, right? Um, and this is an example from Max Wickinson, uh, where he, he starts from 24,000 micrographs or so, and then he basically solved the structure of the slices almost C complex. Does anyone have a laser pointer? This is a bit slow, re slow and react today. Sorry. Yeah, no worry, I will try. Yeah, it's a bit react a bit more slowly today, sorry. Um, okay. So then then he got this consensus map, the C complex of the splice zone. And from just reading the resolution, it goes to 2.8, and you probably think that's pretty good. Let's publish it now. But this is just the beginning of this table, right? So and what he then did was to go through all of this to get the best out of these region that you can see in this map here that are very flexible in the structures, then he can resolve it and result in this atom more atomic model that he can actually uh, understand the biology behind this. And the second example is, is of, from Andrew Carter's lab when they study this axonemo outer dining arm. And they got this beautiful structure which goes to fitting angstrom, which has a lot of bits in it. 
And this is up here in the data processing pipeline. And by going through all of this, they're able to dissect this down to fragments that go to high resolution, which allow them to address you know, biological questions. And the last example is from coming from our lab uh, on human telomerase recruitment complex. And we start again with 50,000 micrographs or so, and then get the consensus map that looks kind of horrible. Uh, you can see, if you look at this, you probably think there's no hope for this. But with some optimism and a lot of data processing, you can see that we now bring it now to the range below, even below three angstrom. So, so for more difficult cases, what I'm going to draw out is kind of the, the data processing workflow we often follow uh, to tackle these more difficult cases. And all of these examples literally follow a very similar logic. So the first stage is, is to go from your raw movies, do all these pre-processing, article picking to get what I call the initial data sets. This is where pretty much you start all your downstream uh, processing. The second stage, this initial data set can then be used to do 2D classification, 3D classification, refinement, and then if it is sufficient resolution, you can use aberration corrections we sure talked about yesterday. And then you get what we call the consensus 3D map. And for many more well-behaved cases, you can literally stop here and you know, start writing up your paper. But for many of us, this is where the fun start. This is where you thank you. This is where you start doing all the fun bits, which include treating heterogeneity and then get the best overall maps as well as the best maps of all interested regions uh, that allow you to address biological questions and then you do model building, which Paul will talk about later today. So the first part is stage one. You get the initial data set. It sounds pretty trivial, right? Just, just do all of these and pick particles. But there are where things can improve, where can you improve things here? And for many cases in our lab, this picking sometimes can be improved significantly. And I'm going to go in a bit more details what I mean by this. So. So let's say I show you this micrograph. Immediately, you can all tell me it's a 20S protosome, because right? it's very well behaved, and you can see very clear features of the particles. But if I were to show you these micrographs, and they're all from published papers, you probably can't tell me what these particles look like in just the first look of it. And just to give you a bit of hints, these are what they end up giving structures of. So for some cases, it's actually quite difficult to uh, for some difficult cases, it's quite difficult to pick properly and also the case for some of the softwares that is used for picking particles. So what we usually do um, is we optimize this a little bit before we go into the stage two. So from the movies, you can do initial picking. And in the past, we used manual picking, but nobody uses that anymore, probably. But, um, but because nowadays, we have so many reference-free picking that we can choose from. So there's a number of uh, packages that I would recommend. Uh, one is Geotomatch, the written by Kai Zhang here from Andrew Carter's lab. Um, and also you have Creline also had log picking. And if you use Appion, you can use dog picker, blob picker, and also top as general picking. And there's two options here in Reline that you can use. So once you use this reference to be picking, you can do some sort of sorting by 2D, 2D classification and get the best subset. You can either go to stage two, but what we often recommend uh, people is to do another round of picking, whether you can squeeze more good particles out of your data. And this can be done via the classical 2D reference picking. So you get 2D from this best subset and repick it in Relion. Or you can use a range of neural network picking algorithms that are currently available. So this is really, there's been an explosion of these uh, softwares, including Warp, Priolo, Topaz, Strain Picking, Deep Picker, and so on. So I do recommend to try this until you kind of find which one is the best for your, for your ensemble. So once you get just this, I just want to show an example when it can be worth it. Um, in 2020, you'll remember we had to stay home for two months and then we we fighting in the cluster because everyone started reprocessing their, their old data. And this is a very nice example when you can get a paper out of it. Um, so this is by Max Wickinson. So he took nine data sets of splitosome, and most of them were actually published uh, from the Nagai's lab. And some of these published structures were staying about 3.8 angstrom, and the best is 3.3 angstrom. 
So what he did is he not just took the particles and go with it, he actually repicked most of these data sets, either by Rilon or the picking, or by Cryolo, as you can see here, or Chi Automatic. He used all range of picking to get the best out of these data sets. And then all of this, which you hear later, we were able to, to get to a much better structure from these, from these pre-processing um, of, of the old data sets. So there's benefits in this. So now let's say we are happy with what we picked, and then we go on to stage two, when we do 2D classification, 3D refinement, and so on. So this sounds very straightforward. There's usually not much can go wrong here, but what happens when, you know, in what cases you had to do things a bit differently in, in, this, in these stages? So basically, in this 2D and 3D classification stage, so some cases, um, when you have prefer orientations, and I'm gonna show, uh, so usually you would do 2D first and 3D. I'm gonna show three examples of TF2H, telomerase and BRC2. And all of these came from the Nogales lab when I was a postdoc there. And what we started noticing that our sample usually get prefer orientations. You already heard from Katharina's talk, this is a very common problem. And what you see in each of these cases, after of the picking particle, we go straight to 3D classification. Same for telomerase and same for PRC2. Just pick particles and do straight 3D. The reason why we, we did this was that we noticed that if you have preferred orientations, sometimes if you do excessive 2D classification sorting, you can lose the rare views in the bad or junk class. You might mistake these rare views for bad 2D classes. And then they get lost at an early stage and then you never recover them. So the maps are more anisotropic. Um, in this case, if we do 2D sorting first before 3D. So what we then turn it around, we literally just go straight to 3D. Sometimes we do 2D for sanity check, but very often it just goes straight from 3D to refinement. And I'm just gonna show you an example from my early days of processing human telomerase work. Um, so if I take my internal data set big particles and do 2D, it looks pretty bad, right? So if you show it to anyone, it's probably okay, the data is pretty bad. But if I do 3D first and do 2D, you can see that there are nice 2D classes there that were just kind of, if you do too much of this, you can, some of these can get lost by, you know, by being thrown out at the earlier stages. So then, beside that, most of the time, also another way when you might want to do things differently is in this 3D up initio. And as Shaw said, this usually, you know, we're pretty happy with, with how this is working currently. But in some cases, you might have to do this a bit differently. Um, and that is where your initial model cannot represent all the conformational stages of the complex. And I'm giving an example here of transcription factor D. So it consists of three lobes called ABC. And sometimes this lobe A can go all the way from here and jumping over here, as you can see here in this movie. And in this case, that means the initial model that represent that one might not represent particle in this class. And you might end up losing particle or particle being mixed in these different stages. Um, so what, uh, what the student in Eva's lab did in, this in his data processing is after he did all the pre-processing, he does uh, what we call the multi-model hard classification he rely on. And what it does is basically you take your particles and just split it into either the canonical form or in the rearranged form uh, using the initial model for both of them. And then once the particle are sorted into these two bins, and then you can do all the classification downstream as if it's one initial model per subset of particle. So, and this can run, is now very nicely implementing CryoSpark when you can use multi-class up initial reconstruction. This is an example from Oliver Clark at Columbia, where he worked on the Acarin complex, and after he did picking, he just 2D and he does a multi-class up initio, and then just took the classes that has all the things he wants to go to the next stage of data processing. And another program, you can also do this, is CryDragon, which I'll talk a little bit uh, later. You can just turn it into the latent space and take the reconstruction from latest, the latent space via decoder and get these up initial from, from your data. So now, 
let's say you you happy with all of this, then you go to refinement. And if your par particle are of highest high enough resolution, you can do all of these aberrations at this stage and get a consensus map. And there are different flavors of heterogeneity of these consensus map can take. And the three examples I show you all have different, uh, all exhibit different behaviors. So for example, spliceosome can really, is, well, what it is is it had a very stable core that are of megadalton size. So it goes to very high resolution in the core, but it has flexible parts tethered to it. And the second example is from our own uh, work where there's no stable core. Every, there's two parts that are moving independently and there's a factor that are moving flexibly relative to these two parts down here as well. You can see the resolution get worse uh, when you have more, when you have no stable core. And for dining, it's, it's even worse. You have more of these flexible parts and some of them has its own stable core, but there's no one stable core for the whole structure. And you can see, depending on the heterogeneity level, you might want to kind of start with a lot of particles, you can do a lot of things later on uh, downstream. So the last bit uh, is when you go from consensus refinement to treating these heterogeneity. So as I mentioned, depending on the nature and the level of the heterogeneity and also the size is your interest region, you can take different approaches. And I roughly divide it into two and coming from this consensus refinement. One is global, where you can do things like multi-body refinement, 3D flexible refinement, heterogeneous reconstruction. And I will go to each of these uh, late after, after this slide. Or you can do local, when you can really manually uh, classify out um, using, for example, using this alignment to do classification with our alignments. You can do signal subtraction manually and do all these local refinement or classifications. I'm going to go through each of these independently. So for the global, um, before I go into details, I'm going to kind of introduce a concept that has been used a lot um, for many of the work that we do. And, and it's called signal subtraction. It's also using multi-body refinement. So let's say you have a molecule that has two parts, the red part and the yellow part, and this is a gamma secretase. So the red part is a transmembrane part and you have the detergent micelles on the outside. And let's say uh, this is uh, published by Sao Chen Bai in 2015, and let's say we introduced in the red part, uh, but then in the experimental image, it's always a projection of the red part and the yellow part together. So if you want to refine the red part alone, it can be difficult because this also, the image still have the, the, the micelle around it. So what you do is you take a mass around the detergent de micelle, generate an, a model for that, and then in silico, you can do the projections of, of this yellow part uh, into a kind of a simulated uh, projection. And then because, as you know, our images are um, has a CTF factor, so you kind of modulate this in silico projection with CTF. And then you take your experimental image, you subtract this away from your experimental image. And if this is done cleanly, what you left with in your image is just the red part, which can then be used to refine against the reference, so the transmembrane protein, uh, the transmembrane part. So this is the kind of the essence of doing signal subtraction. So this is kind of, uh, is very useful if you're interested in the red part only. But let's say you have multiple parts and you want to all refine them independently like this. Uh, you can do this automatically in Relon, uh, in this tab here, which is multi-body refinement. So what is this? This is an automated uh, iterative and multi-focus refinement and using signal subtraction. And I'm going to show you in more detail the next slide what is involved. Um, and what it can do is you can also do principal component analysis on orientations and put it together in a movie of the motions. So let's say you have three domain floppy protein called MRC as shown here. And they are kind of moving, you know, relative, with relatively against each other. And then what you do, you get a consensus map around these three, uh, three letter. And then what you do is for each of the letter, for example, you're interested in taking uh, focus on M, you take a projections, in silico projections of RC and you subtract it from the experimental image of MRC 
and what you left with is just uh, ex an experimental image that, that only has the M. And then you refine it against the initial model that has only the M. So you can put a mask around M, the balloon is a mask. Um, and then this would then, because now you take away the flexibility from the RC domain, the orientations of the M in this refinement would be improved. So you can get a new orientation of this letter M uh, relative to the whole particle. And then you do this simultaneously for the R and the C letter as well. For each iteration, you have a new orientations, which can then be updated up here, and then the signal subtraction started over again. You can see on purpose, Shaw's, uh, Shaw's and Soch, Soch and Takanori put kind of uh, imperfect signal subtraction here where you still get a ghost of the C, right? So with time, this subtraction will get better. And you do this until this, uh, the orientation stays almost the same and the resolution of each of the parts do not improve anymore. So this is where it converges. So the, also in this, just keep in mind for this to work well, the idea size of each body got to be about 150 or more kilodaltons. So when you have working with something small, this might not work very well. But with the current implementations, but we heard from yesterday that this might change with the blush uh, new algorithm and that the shows presented yesterday. So now this is then applied for the spliceosomal B complex. So the structure of this is on the left here. So it's then Takanori divided into four domains. And this is, these are the masks he put around each of the domain for SF3B, helicase, the core, and the foot. And on the top panel are each of these domains in the consensus refinement. The core is pretty good already. And the food, for example, down here is also pretty good already. But the helicase domain and the S3B domain is quite bad in terms of flexibility. And at the bottom here is the outcome of the multi-body refinement. So you can see the core is already good, so it doesn't improve it as much. Same for the food, just slight improve. But the helicase domain and the S3B domain is really much improved uh, by doing this uh, iterative signal subtraction and refinement. Again, you can see this uh, via this local resolution estimation. This is the estimation. These are kind of off the roof. But after signal subtraction, you really can see significant improvement going from here to here. Also, what you can do um, with, with, this day, with this refinement is that each the particle now has four bodies. And each the body has its own orientations uh, from the refinement. So you can do what, what is called principal component analysis and map out the motions uh, that these bodies have relative to one another in your experimental image and kind of plot them in this, in this plot. When you can plot them, these eigenvectors are pretty much representing the motion and, and this is the variance of this motion. Let's say we're interested in the second eigenvector and you can map what the motion in this, in this represents. And then also even with the, in a movie, you can see how the motion of these domains uh, along these eigenvectors. So also, as you already heard recently, there's a lot of developments in machine learning. And some of the community, people in the community of machine learning uh, community also became interested in EM because some of it can be applied to heterogeneity uh, kind of treatment in cryo-EM reconstruction. And one of very successful example is this cryo-dragon algorithm. So in a nutshell, what this is actually uh, does is it's, uh, it contains two neural networks. One is called encoder, one is called decoder. And, and because like all the machine learning algorithm had to do the training first, and during the training, what it does, it takes your particle image, put it through an encoder. The encoder would then encode this in a low dimensional latent space, which literally represents your heterogeneity. And then we take that from the latent space through a decoder, which then re will represent your particle image as a slide through the Fourier transform of your 3D volume. So you already heard from Shaw's talk yesterday, a projection from, of your particle is a slide through a Fourier transform of, uh, of, the, of your uh, volume. So, and it will train on a subset of your particles. And once the encoder and the decoder is trained, then you can go and do real analysis. And during this real analysis, what you do is you just take all your particles, feed it through this train encoder, and then we'll put your particle in this 
very simplified but very easy to visualize uh, a latent space which represents heterogeneity uh, within, your, within your data set. You can see here where these very dark regions represent high density of the particles. And let's say if you want to be interested in what happened to these subset of particles like this pink here, you can then put it through the decoder which then reconstruct a 3D volume uh, from, from this latent space of your, of your particles. So you can do this for pretty much any uh, arbitrary values from the latent space through decoder and get the reconstruction along this latent space. So this is pretty much the concept behind CryoDragon. And recently, CryoSpark also has its own implementation, and this is called 3D Flex. And the way this works is kind of a bit different from CryoDragon, um, because what it requires is actually a canonical a high resolution 3D map. And then it uses uh, a, like a parameterized latent space, which, which uh, like describes this deformation field. And what it does is basically this field encodes for non-rigid motion. And then you then take this field and you deform your canonical 3D map through convection. And what you get is this, this convected map. And this is an example of uh, what a deformation field look like. And then once you get this convected map, you can then do projections, adding noise and CTF, and compare the, this simulated uh, 2D images uh, to your experimental data. So they perform this on, on the TRISNERP uh, data. And you can see here are some examples of the convected density. So here they're plotting the plus and minus uh, density that of some one standard deviation away from the, in the latent space. And you can see that they can map some of these motions along, uh, along the, the other latent coordinates. Uh, so there's like five latent coordinates and they map the latent ones against the other latent two and three and four and five and so on. You can see some of the motions from these convected uh, 3D density. And they also show that compared to the conventional refinement, they can also get improved resolutions on all the parts of flexible parts of the structure. So, so then let's, let's say that's, then that's the global and then let's go to the local. This is where I'm gonna go into more details of the, these examples I mentioned. And there's two concepts that I would like to first emphasize before I go into details, which might be useful to think about uh, when you do this kind of manual uh, refinement and classification. The first is the mask. And this is actually quite important when you do this, uh, this kind of classification. And what you want to do is to make sure that the mask covers the heterogeneity of the region of interest. And what I mean by this is, for example, you take an example of this spliceosomal B complex, and this is moving um, really, you know, to a very large extent. Let's say you make a mass that are around there, right? And if you make a mass like this, it would kind of cut off some of the particles that are moving in the rest region. So this is kind of, is too tight if you want to do focus classification or refinement and so on. What you want to do is kind of make a mask that covers all these movements. Otherwise, you might cut off particles that are moving to the extreme ends um, of, this, of the particle. And the second um, parameter that's actually quite important to play around with is called the regularization T values. And, and in the Reliant GUI, um, it's present in both the 2D and 3D classification tab. And you can find it down here. And what this is in, in simple term is the, is the relative way between the experimental data versus the prior. So Shaw's already talked about the prior yesterday. So the higher value of this, the more weight you put on your experimental data. But then also keep in mind that your data is very noisy. So if you put too much weight in your data, you might end up having overfitting as well. So just, just keep this number in mind. And, and I will show you how some of the examples that really use is T to really squeeze out on some of this heterogeneity in the ensemble. So I'm gonna go through uh, the first example of the spliceosome C complex, where you have this core here and this flexible regions. So there's a few kind of ways you can deal with heterogeneity and, and it's different from the large region versus the small region. So for things that are more than 150 do kilo doton, the simplest way to do this is getting your consensus refinement you do signal subtraction, rebox, and recentering, and so on. And all of this can be done with just a click in rely on nowadays. 
and and then you do what I call you know what we often call 3D classification with our alignment. So because here the alignment from the core region is very good, so you can skip all the alignment for this classification and use a, just a normal T value because these regions have very large uh, mass. And then you find your class of interest, do 3D refinement, and for example, this region here go from this being floppy to 3.5 angstrom. And you can see an example of the masses being used by Max in this example here, so it's a pretty large mask. And same for this second region here, which is the helicase. You can see that again, you just do signal subtraction, 3D classification with our alignment, and then refine that this goes to 7.1 angstrom, which is a bit worse than this, but it's probably more flexible as well. And again, the third region are the same. You just do the same procedure, and you're able to improve it from this kind of floppy uh, resolution to below 3.8, uh, to below 4 angstrom. So things get interesting for smaller regions because this is where you have to do things a bit differently. Um, so let's take an example of this, this region here, which is quite tiny in, in, the, in the map. And so what you can do first, again, uh, from this consensus refinement, you signal subtract, rebox, and recentering around this region. And then what Max did is he did two rounds of classification with our alignment. You can see these T values is pretty high. Right, compared to the, con the normal four that are in the rely on uh, conditions. So smaller regions is generally work better with higher T values. And then he, because this region is also quite small. So as you know from Richard's talk that small parts are not very good for, real, uh, for cryo EM. So you can't really refine this independently because it's too small. So what you have to do is now you classify to this rigid region of this domain you then revert it to the original particle that has all the, all the large parts that align very well. And then this is allow better alignments. And then you do 3D class refinement and you get this overall map which has better density of this region versus the consensus. So again, the second part is, is even smaller. So he did the same procedure, but now he tried really going for really high T, either 100 or 1,000 and a couple of rounds of this. And then again, he had to revert it to original particle to get better alignment. You can see this is a tiny bit in the structure. So it's too impressive. You can, you can resolve this very small domain. And, and there's a third one that's down here, which is a bit harder to do. So what he had to do is not just one classification. He did many different classification and find out kind of either with or without signal subtraction, with no alignment, various T, is able to tease down a subset of particles uh, that he then revert to the original uh, particle for better alignment and resolve this here in this structure. So you can do many, many different ways with these smaller regions. For the second example is of our, our human telomerase recruitment complex. And, and here the structure says kind of three bits we're interested in, the top one, the bottom one, and some factors that's bound down here in, in, in the bottom lobe. Um, so the bottom lobe is we call the catalytic core, but you don't need to worry about what this means. Um, so first, again, we like max, we do a signal subtraction, rebox, and recentering. But the next part is a bit different because the two parts are moving independently. So our consensus refinement doesn't have very good alignments. So instead of doing classification with our alignment, we had to do with alignment because the initial alignment here is not very good. So then after this, we then refine the best class. And then we also have prefer orientations. So we do another step, which in this case, 2D classification with our alignment, using the alignment from this refinement. And then we remove dominant views. And this has been used previously by Andrew Carter's lab, by Kai Zhang for the dynecting uh, complex. And then by doing this, we get a more isotropic refinement of, of this bottom lobe here. And then we take it through classification with our alignment this time, because this alignment is pretty good already. And then we found a structure that has one of the factors bound to reasonable resolution. But then we put in actually three factors. There's another one missing out here. So in order to resolve it, uh, what we did, we put a mass around, around this region here that has the missing factor. And then we classify with this mass only around here. And then this is uh, also, again, with the different T values. And when we refine this, we recover this 
this factor. There's still one missing that we, we can't find in the structure. So we put, took it through CryoDragon to see whether we can find anything here. And, and you can see here, these, uh, these, even though we classify them heavily, there's still a lot of heterogeneity when you put it through CryoDragon, and especially in, this is not the part we're interested in, but we couldn't find our third factor even though we, uh, we tried this algorithm. So it's probably too flexible to be resolved. And, and the other to top part of the structure is what we call the HACA part. Again, don't worry about the names. And we do the same procedure. We signal subtract, rebox, recentering, and then classify with alignment because the initial alignment is not very good. And then we take it through classification without alignment and refine. At this stage, we got a really nice map at 2.7 angstrom. But in the structure, there's a loop that we're interested in, which is just eight amino acids. Um, you know, it's kind of disorder. I draw it here because we have a structure, but eventually, but it's disorder and we want to resolve this loop. Um, so what we did was we put a, a mask around this loop region here, which is in orange, and then we perform mask classification with the T values of 500, because this is only eight amino acids, so we use a very high T value. And by doing this, we can then fish out a subset of particles that go to 2.7 angstrom, and that has this loop present in the, in the data set. And also, again, we also ask, is there any other confirmation of this loop that present in the structure that we couldn't fish out? So to do that, um, George took a different approach to actually put this refinement through CrowdSpark, 3D variability analysis, and then perform a range of classification, non-uniform refinement, and then put it back into reliant eventually. And we found another confirmation of this loop of just eight amino acids. You can see how we can use these to really tease down to very small region of the structure. And the last example I'm going to go through is this dining, uh, dining complex uh, by, by uh, Andrew Carter's lab. So this can be divided into two parts. The top part consists of three dining motors, and the second part is the tail. And, and Ferdos from Andrew's lab uh, process these independently. So to get the dining motor, and you can see here it has three dining motors, and each of them has different flexibility. So for this uh, pink one that's called Dine 3, um, what she did was she first did a consensus refinement and put a mask around just this dining three motor and classify without alignment again at T value of 10. And then this allowed her to find a good class that has a good density of this dining motor. But the alignment is not good when you put this such a big mask. So she did mask refinement with this tight uh, region of this dining uh, three motor to get better alignment of this region. And then again, another round of classification with our alignment, this time the T value is boost to 50. And then she refined this, she's able to get down to four angstrom from this 15 angstrom consensus refinement. And the other two are treated a bit differently. So then what they did was they took a mask that has covered everything, which is called global 3D classification. Again, with our alignment, which is a normal T values. And then they perform 3D refinement. And from this refinement, which is a more improved from this consensus refinement, they use this for signal subtraction for the other two dining uh, motor domains called dine four and five, and then get through 3D refinement of this. And then from this, they then perform mass refinement around these, uh, around these two motor domains, followed by classification with our alignment with very high T values. One is 100, one is 50 and then that allowed them to, to perform refinement and get to about five angstrom structure from, for the other two. So it's more flexible, so it's lower resolution than this, this uh, for dining three motor. And then for the tail, what they do is even more elaborate. It's, it's, it has a lot of different regions. It has this extra factors, upper tail and lower tail. So to get this whole tail region, they use again the global classification, followed by 3D refinement, and they're able to put a mass around this, this entire tail, refine this to 6.7 angstrom. You can see here this significantly improved from the from overall refinement. And then for the 
other regions, in individual regions of the tail, they do a bit differently. So they take this consensus refinement, do a mass classification with our alignment around this whole tail region. And with the 3D refinements, they can then they can then get a better reconstruction. And this is consists of two parts called Schulin, which is an extra factor that hold the three dining together and, and the lower tail. So for Shulin, they put a mass around only Shulin from this consensus refinement, do this classification again, very high T value on the way to 100. And then they took this best class and refine with the entire thing, which allowed them to do two things. So they then get a better refinement of the Shulin using a tighter mask. And then again, classification you see is a very, very similar uh, with multiple rounds of classification. Again, this time with higher T. And the best class is then putting through two different refinements with two different masks that allow them to get the core region to be very high and the kind of the peripheral region that interact with other part of the structure to low resolution that allowed them to piece together the interactions of the Shulin and the other surrounding regions. And this, from the same refinement, then they use it for signal subtraction to get the lower tail region, which is behind Shulin. And then again, they just with a 3D refinement in this case, and another round of classification that allowed them to get a subset that goes to 5.9 angstrom. So these are very elaborate examples how you can use all of these parameters and masking in order to get to much improved resolution. So I guess I, there's some general advice for processing these different difficult data set. Is some of it is just really case by case example. Um, the first is I would recommend to maybe try to start small. If you have a clean data set, I would just try testing your strategies of small subset of particles. Um, and what also helps is that you can use the Rosenthal uh, Henderson plot to estimate how much more data you need. So this is very useful. Say if you want to aim for four angstrom and you have X many particles that are at seven angstrom, you can use this plot to tell you how many more micrographs I need to collect and how many more days I need to request on the CREOs when you write to Andrew and fill out that form and that's being sent out every Monday. Um, so it is very useful to test the strategies on this small subset. And second, I would say just iterate, try again and again. And if any steps are suboptimal, just go back and keep trying. Um, and also if there's new algorithms that are coming out, I would highly recommend to, to try and see if it works on your case. Sometimes not everything works for everything, so just have to try and see if it's, is this the right one for you. And last is parallelization. So I show you these example, there's T values of whatever, 50, 100, 1000. It's not that we know what to use. This is just a matter of trying so many different things and see what works. And I just remember that what is reported in the paper are not likely the only ones that, that were tested by the authors. And for us, some of our jobs have over a thousand jobs because we just try everything and see which one gives you the best outcome. And, and just, yeah, don't give up too early because there might be jam in some of your data. But if all else do not work, I would consider make better sample, better grid, and collect better data. And you can go back to the previous lectures uh, that has some information how you can do this better. So with that, I will leave with this summary slides. And this afternoon, uh, Paul will talk more about what happened when you get your maps and do this model building. So yeah, I would like to thank a lot of people who's uh, provided materials for my talk, Ferdos, Rafa, Shores, uh, Zala and George, Siggy and Max, and also the people in Shores lab who over the years have really taught me um, image processing and also uh, have a lot of these good discussions how to to do um, how to deal with some of the stuff we we have some of the problems we have with our sample, and all the Nogales lab members for a lot of discussions when I was there. And our, our unsung heroes, the EM facility and scientific computing for all of this, you know, you can imagine doing these jobs is impossible without, without these huge supports. And, and we are very lucky to have this amazing infrastructure. And thank you for your attention. <laughs>